Hello, John from the Lib Dem Podcast here. We are delighted to say that this episode is sponsored by Prater Reigns. Now more than ever, you need a professional-looking online presence and website. Prater Reigns have been helping Liberal Democrat campaigns succeed for 18 years. Their Lib Dem Foci package combines a website, social media and email system to help Lib Dems win. You'll receive great support from real people, fair pricing and a huge range of features to choose from. Prater Reigns are already the bespoke developers for Lighthouse, Lib Dem Draw Online and the LD Directory. They combine a talented system design with an unrivaled understanding of our party, our data and our systems. To find out more, check out the Prater Reigns website at praterains.co.uk slash liberal dash democrats. Now, on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Lib Dem podcast. Now, we have spoken to people across the UK, but for a long time people have said to us, We need to talk about Northern Ireland. And I can't have imagined how privileged we are to have two fantastic guests with us. And of course, Richard Kemp, the leader of the Liverpool Lib Dems. We have the leader of the Alliance Party, Naomi Long, with us. Good good afternoon, Naomi. Good afternoon. Uh, And we also have the Alliance Party's MP as well in Westminster. uh, And that's Stephen Ferry. Hello, Stephen. Hi there. So, I mean, there's... There's all sorts going on uh, at the moment in regards to Brexit, about um, the, everything that's happening in Stormont. But I suppose my first bit is just to introduce what you guys uh, do. So Stephen obviously is the MP, uh, the, the single MP alliance uh, have in Westminster. Now, Naomi, I was trying to work out exactly what titles you've had across your political career, <laughs> and I started running out of ink. Uh, <laughs> so you've gone right the way up. For, you've been a councillor, the Lord Mayor of Belfast, you were an MP, you were the yes. MEP for Northern Ireland, yes. and now you've been, you're obviously elected to Northern Irish Assembly, and you've also now been elected to be a Minister of... Uh, Minister of State yes. as well. So, is there anything else you want to do? You know, is the you know any other positions that you could possibly go for? Well, you know, I, I never like to I never like to curb the party's ambitions. You know, so um, <laughs> we're we're always open. We're always open to growth. Um, but look, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's twenty years I've been in politics, and a lot of those posts kind of came to me in unusual circumstances and some of them I fell into and others fell on me. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a sign of just how much the party has grown that we've had those opportunities. I think when I became a councillor, I stood originally and I was told, the only reason I did it, in fact, was because I was told I probably wouldn't get elected anyway. That's um, what we tell people in yeah, England as well. It's, yeah. it's very effective. <laughs> it's very effective. Um, but, you know, when I look back now and think of where I am sitting as Minister for Justice, Um, in Northern Ireland and that we have an MP, you know, that we have seen that kind of growth. And that's been a consistent position pretty much on and off since 2010. We've had an MP for all but a couple of years. You know, we've had a minister in government for all but a short period of time. Um, And I think it's just, it it just speaks to where Alliance has gone and how much we've grown um, over that period. And there's been a lot of hard work has gone into that behind the scenes um, in terms of political organization and policy development and everything else. But, you know, I think it's more a tribute to the party and the, the, the kind of state of the party um, rather than any kind of particular talent on my part for collecting titles. Um, I actually managed at one point, I think, I've, I, think I actually have more titles than Ian Paisley had um, on his demise, which is quite, which is, which is quite a, 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 a quite a claim. I think the only one I haven't had is I haven't been First Minister of Northern Ireland, and I'm not quite sure in my lifetime that we'll see it. But I'm ambitious for that for the party too. It would be nice to see us upend the system in Northern Ireland um, and have a party that isn't aligned either unionist or nationalist as one of the main two political parties in Northern Ireland, because I see that as the main divide in our community. Those of us who aren't aligned around the constitutional question but look at politics in a much broader way and those who are aligned solely around the constitutional question and make their decisions around uh, through that lens so I suppose that for me is the bigger that's that's the way I would like to frame the politics here and that's what I'm working on so we'll see what happens and Stephen's uh, had a few titles himself because I seem to remember mm. you were chief executive of the party at one time weren't you Stephen? Oh, oh, general only secretary. general secretary general, general secretary, secretary. Right. Yeah. we're all fighting the then Stephen yes uh, I was quite happy with that. So yeah, I've been. Um, I was first elected back in 1993 to um, 
North Down Borough Council, as then was. So I've held elective office now for going on um, 27 years, so uh, in one guise or another. So I, I was um, first elected to the Assembly in 2007 and then became Minister for Employment and Learning between 2011 and 2016. We look back with fondness as a time of relative stability compared to the current <laughs> the situation. So at the time, it was traumatic enough. Um, yeah. And then um, managed to get elected in December last year to um, Parliament for, for North Down. Um, probably a, a slight surprise, uh, but last year was a, a year of full of surprises in terms of elections. Um, but it all seems perfectly logical now looking back at it. And uh, obviously work very closely with the Lib Dems um, in, in Parliament. Um, I don't take the whip because um, I'm elected as, as, as Alliance, uh, but we share this, the same values and um, we, we would consult very frequently with the Lib Dems. I, I don't follow the Lib Dem whip, but I receive the Lib Dem whip. <laughs> if that's not a too subtle yeah. distinction. Sorry. I've never followed a Lib Dem whip either, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> and I unless well, I've written it, I'm quite in favour of those ones. <laughs> so I, 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 see, I see it, so I, I see what's going on and what, what they're doing, and there's a guide, but I, I've, they, I take my own decisions. Mostly we end up in the same place uh, on virtually every issue anyway, so uh, that's a, a good sign that, that liberal values are, are, are alive and kicking. Yeah, I. Uh, if you'd explain then, because I'm actually a member of the Alliance Party, although yeah. I clearly live in Liverpool. And one of the reasons I do that is because of the great links between our two uh, cities. But just explain why you're not the Northern Ireland Liberal Democrats then. Well, I mean, I think first of all, um, we predate the Liberal Democrats, of course. I would have to say that um, <laughs> because we were formed. Well, we were formed in 1970 by people who really wanted to try to find a way forward in Northern Ireland um, at a time which was particularly bleak. Um, the troubles were just about to start in 1969. We had some fairly um, significant incidents that we knew were going to be um, fairly momentous in terms of the, the shape our history would take. And people at that stage, I wasn't even born when the party was formed, but people at that stage came forward and wanted to try and create a different kind of society, one where people tried to celebrate their shared values and shared heritage, um, rather than always seeing these things as points of division. And so that was really the foundations of, of the Alliance Party. But by its nature, because it wasn't part of those kind of traditional blocks in society, it also attracted a lot of people, for example, former members of the Northern Ireland Labour Party, many of them came um, towards Alliance, others went towards the SDLP when it was formed um, just a, a short time later. Um, and also I think that there was within Alliance a sort of a more liberal minded streak, people who didn't see themselves as a label, who didn't see themselves simply as part of a tribe in Northern Ireland, but people who wanted to do things on the basis of what was the right thing to do for everyone in society and to try to be more, um, I suppose, progressive in their views. And I suppose that's developed over time and it's understandable, I think, that um, with the Liberal Democrats and their kind of emergence and growth um, that we would be aligned to them through things like ALDE, um, and that obviously became very important to us when we were in um, the EU and when we were first elected. I mean, I have the, the odd distinction of being the first Alliance Party member elected to the European Parliament and having served in probably the most historic term of office in and it was the <laughs> one in which Brexit took place and we all lost our seats. So it's one of those kind of things where I went in and it, it, it ended very dramatically. But we had the opportunity through ALD even now to continue to have that conversation uh, with other people with shared liberal values. But Northern Ireland has very special issues, circumstances, challenges. And I think that the Alliance Party needs the independence to be able to approach those in a way that is bespoke for our situation. So um, we would have members of the party, we've always said, provided the party doesn't contest an election in Northern Ireland, people can join whatever other parties they want, North or South, um, and they can they can do that also um, in, in terms of GB. So if somebody wants to be a member of the Labour Party and a member of Alliance, they can be. If they want to be a member of the Liberal Democrats and a member of Alliance, they can. Start contesting elections against us, that stops. Um, but other than that, we're pretty relaxed about it because I think it's important that we... Um, 
that we kind of hold up our liberal values. And I think those have become more and more important over recent years. I suppose it's that thing that initially we focused very much on the divisions, the kind of historic divisions in our society and tried to bridge those. But I think as our society has changed and become more diverse and more open, some of the challenges about creating an integrated um, and a, a, a diverse community where people are welcomed and celebrated, um, I think the challenges change. And so the issues that we are dealing with now are not just those around sectarianism, but we're also tackling those core issues around racism, um, around how we engage with people with disabilities, how we engage with the LBTQ plus community, how we um, are more open um, and a more, a more liberal society and how we balance um, the need for people to have rights with responsibilities that come with that and actually trying to be just a different kind of society. So I think from that point of view, that's really where Alliance comes from historically. Mm -hmm. But it's understandable, I suppose, that we became a magnet for people in society who were um, free thinkers, who wanted to do things slightly differently than the traditional way. And I think as such, Alliance was a natural home for liberals and for progressives in Northern Ireland. And I think that's a good thing for us as a party. And I think a lot of our young members really appreciate both the heritage of where we come from in terms of tackling sectarianism and um, paramilitarism and all those things, which we still deal with as legacy issues now, but also are really enthused about how we move forward in terms of transforming democracy in Northern Ireland, because we're not always the most progressive part of the UK. Um, we often move much more slowly when it comes to individual freedoms and rights than other parts of the UK. And Alliance certainly wants to be a voice um, to persuade and argue um, for increased individual rights so that people have the same rights and freedoms that they should enjoy in any other liberal democracy. Um, and we want to make sure that that's the case in Northern Ireland too. I, I, just a little ironic story connected with that. I was over in... Uh... Uh, Northern Ireland doing some work on the Reform of Public Administration Act and I went to see John Matthews, I think he was called, who was the Mayor of Larne at the time, who had great delight in telling me that the previous day he'd had a four-hour uh, council meeting about civil partnerships and that Northern Ireland had become the first place in the UK because of an accident to actually produce something, which was, and it was probably the last part of the UK that actually wanted it at the time. Yeah, I think that was during, um, that was during the kind of 2003 to 2007 yeah. suspension. And it was actually um, Peter Hayen who, who brought that in as part actually of, I think, his carrot and stick approach he decided that he would threaten civil partnerships to try to horrify people back into the assembly. It didn't work, but it did work for the people who wanted civil partnerships, which was <laughs> great. Um, and I suppose in some ways we had, you know, we've had similar challenges around things like equal marriage, um, around access to termination of pregnancy in Northern Ireland, um, where unfortunately those things tend to be accessed either via the courts um, and litigation or alternatively in periods where the assembly is suspended and one of the things that Stephen and I are you know are very passionate about um, is the fact that we think the assembly should be mature enough to be able to deliver um, to be able to deliver these things as part of our legislative program to be able to do things like for example at the moment we may even move ahead who knows um, in terms of England and Wales, but we're actually working with other ministers at the minute and the executive to look at banning conversion therapy, for example. And that's something that I think it's not just one of those issues that impacts on the few people who might seek conversion therapy. It, it speaks volumes about the, the kind of society we live in, where yeah. we accept people for who they are and not expect them to change. And I think by making that a really clear statement, that is an encouragement to people about their sense of self-worth and their confidence and their, their, their connectedness in society. So those are the sorts of issues. They're, they're often controversial in Northern Ireland. They shouldn't be, but they are. But they're the kind of issues that we want to really work hard on because if we're going to have what we always ask for, which is a shared future, it has to include everyone. Um, and it has to be something that's meaningful in terms of people being able to access their rights, being able to be part of the community and being a respected part of the community. So, yeah, sometimes we're slower. Other times these things happen um, in quick succession. But we, we need that change. And there's an appetite in the public, I think, that outstrips 
sometimes the political capacity to deliver. Um, and I'm sure, Stephen, you would agree with that, that the, the appetite for things like change around um, equal marriage and so on was far greater than the political support for it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I suppose the other thing I would add, um, just as to why Alliance is a natural liberal progressive voice, is if you look at um, I mean, the essential liberal ideology, it's about standing up to against vested interests, the status quo, standing up to, to prejudice. So well, historically, if you look at the evolution of, of liberalism in the English context, it's about standing up to the, the, the monarchy or to landed interests, um, uh, standing up let's say, to, to church power in some, in some respects. In our context of, of, of the Ireland or Northern Ireland today, the biggest characteristic of society was the sectarianism. The division into who, in a sense, something we challenge, but to the impression of two monolithic communities. So, if you're focusing on the individual and the notion that people are free to def to define themselves and be individuals as, as core li liberal values, then in the context of Northern Ireland, that, that manifests itself as being that challenge to those vested interests. So, people like to talk to us about about being the establishment party, but uh, as true liberals, we were the ones challenging the de facto uh, establishment structures um, in, in Northern Ireland. And I suppose in that respect, um, it's, it's been a lot easier for us to be at the forefront then of campaigns around a lot of the progressive issues of today, because that largely just builds upon that uh, basic uh, historical narrative for us. Politics would be a bit rough in Liverpool. I would say, well, yes, but it's, it's worse in Northern Ireland. I, I, and at so, so, some stages, politicians uh, were put under great pressure, and I know Naomi was, particularly when she was the Lord Mayor. Is there, do you think, much difference in the safety or other risks faced uh, by politicians in Northern Ireland now? And is that different to, say, 25 years ago? Well, I would have to be honest and say that, yes, I mean, I think that there can be. I mean, I, I had a difficult time, particularly around, it's actually when I was an MP, um, and there was a decision taken in Belfast around flags, and we went with the UK wide approach and, you know, all hell let loose in Northern Ireland at that time. There were flags protests, there were attacks on our premises, there were death threats. I was sent bullets in the post as were colleagues. Um, you know, our offices were targeted. Stephen's office, there was an attempted arson attack. There was an incendiary device attached to Trevor Lund's office. My office was petrol bombed. A, a police officer almost lost their life because their car, which was actually protecting my office, was petrol bombed while they were inside it. And so, you know, it, yes, there is a, a real risk. But equally, when I was in Westminster, and I think Stephen will, will be acutely aware of this, the culture in terms of the dangers that politicians face, um, I think has changed dramatically there as well. I would have been an outlier at that point when I was in Parliament. So MPs were shocked that I needed security at my office, that there were risks, threats against me and so on. That would have been an outlier. It would have been unusual. I think during the time I was in Westminster, that became much more um, commonplace, sadly, right across the UK of people's offices becoming a target for political um, protest rather than a, a place where you deliver a service to your constituency. Um, and obviously, you know, with Joe Cox and so on, it kind of brought it home in very sharp relief. And I think that Brexit also kind of heightened the tension in the conversation. And I think Brexit is the only thing that I have ever seen, um, maybe since the poll tax, which was some time ago, maybe the miners' strike um, back in the 80s. Those are the only kind of times I've ever seen the kind of visceral hatred on the streets um, that we would have seen in Northern Ireland over political issues. Um, it's, it's that level of kind of absolute fury and anger, but often misdirected, um, often... Mm you know, very much unleashed on a, on a group of people. And, you know, I think in some ways there has been a coarsening of politics. Um, the dialogue that we see in the chamber can be, you know, and I think at a time when Northern Ireland has maybe slightly improved or tried to improve, we've seen other parts of the world drifting back. So I'm not sure that we're so much worse 
than yeah. other places anymore um, because I think the risk to all politicians um, is fairly significant. There is a particular risk here, obviously. I mean, my particular job as Justice Minister places me in conflict um, with some of those involved in terrorism and organised crime and other things. So there are particular risks that we need to manage. But I think genuinely there is a wider risk now. I mean, I was in Westminster um, during the kind of Brexit debates um, while I was an MEP, so before exit had happened. And I was, I was in Westminster having meetings and I went outside and I looked at Parliament Square. I looked at Abingdon Green there, College Green, where they do all of the, the interviews and so on. And I was struck by how different a place it was to five years ago when I was an MP. Because the crowds outside, the aggressive shouting, the constant noise, the jostling of MPs going back and forward, that was not a feature at all when I was there. You would have occasional protests um, in Parliament Square and then people would kind of move on. Um, but the aggression and the anger and the, the, the tension in the air is the only way I can describe it. There was a real tension. That, to me, was much more reminiscent of some of the protests we would have had mm. here um, mm. politically and much less reminiscent of the kind of very civilised political pro protests that I would have witnessed in my time as an MP. So in many ways, um, I think perhaps, not to be rude, but I think perhaps the, the level of politics has kind of descended to meet us on the way up, um, mm. if anything. And I think that's a bit of a shame. because have I we think all we been should... trumped? Yeah, well, I think there's an element of that. I think there is an element of that. Um, and I think it's a shame because actually one of the things that I admired about Westminster was the civility of the discourse. I might not always have agreed with people. I might have had robust disagreements and arguments, but there was a civility to how people expressed themselves that sometimes was lacking um, in Northern Ireland's politics. And I think that it's a shame in some ways that a little bit of that has been lost. And I hope that whatever happens with Brexit, that people kind of regain that sense of, I don't know, a bit more respect for each other and the role of Parliament and other things. But that's hard to do unless the people in Parliament um, and in government in particular respect the role of Parliament. And that's a real challenge at the minute. And I know Stephen feels very strongly about that. I was just bit about getting settled in and finding my feet and getting the routine going whenever COVID struck. So we have now yeah. in the most extraordinary um, uh, part of it that's probably that there's ever been uh, in terms of how it operates. So um, it's, it's fine. I mean, we, we, Brexit has probably been my most critical issue um, to date. And um, so... We've been pushing that uh, quite strongly, though with an 80-seat majority, it's uh, very difficult to get any uh, change in action. So it's about highlighting the issues and, and, and um, challenging what are often quite extraordinary um, decisions and uh, positions being taken by uh, the, the government. Um, beyond that, I'm trying not to become typecast as just a Northern Ireland MP who shows up and uh, discusses Northern Ireland issues. I'm trying to take part in some of the wider UK and international debates and just uh, advocating liberal values and applying those to the situations we, we find ourselves in. So um, while not sort of intruding too much on, some, on the English spending decisions as such, talking more around sort of the um, human social rights value type things. Yeah, yeah, social policy, anti-racism. Um, pro asylum seeker type type stuff. So, and in, in some senses, I, I probably have a bit more freedom just to, to, per, to push the boundaries. One of the things I have noticed is there's probably two two features of this parliament that are are currently standing out. One is that Labour are very um, very careful in what they do. Um, Keir Starmer is. Um, taking the view that confidence uh, is the way to uh, undermine Johnson and, and to take power. The difficulty is that in doing so, he is essentially fighting the battle on Johnson's narrative. Um, they are allowing the Conservatives to set the, the, the agenda and Labour are coming across as the more moderate or more pragmatic version of that. Mm. But they're not prepared to take a radical position or stand up for uh, non-conservative values, whether you're a social democrat or a liberal uh, or anything else. 
uh, lest he gets a negative headline in some of the papers. So it's very, very, very cautious, uh, which is a little bit um, frustrating, which is why I think the rule for both the Lib Dems and our, ourselves just to be that more, more radical edge in terms of, of as we said, in, in certain areas. The other dynamic, which is going to then rebound potentially in Northern Ireland, is that is the, the whole issue of Scottish independence. The, the most difficult uh, pantomime or challenging or better d- debates in the, uh, on the floor tend to be between the Conservatives and the SNP. Um, so we are building up to, uh, as things currently stand, a major crisis next spring if the SNP come back with a majority. Uh, and claim the entitlement to have another referendum. Uh, what happens exactly is, is unclear, but it, it is going to uh, perhaps post Brexit and post COVID become the main narrative of, of, the, of this parliament. That obviously has ma- massive repercussions for us in Northern Ireland as well if, um, if, if the, the Scottish issue uh, becomes really live. Yeah, that was, I mean, John's got a question relating to that, haven't you, John? <laughs> uh, well, I- Cause also, trouble now, Mr. Potter. <laughs> no, no, no. I, before we get there, I just want to kind of come back because, not again, I don't want to assume all our listeners and viewers automatically know all the ins and outs of Northern Irish politics. And so I want to talk about your election, Stephen, but also just to explain that while the Alliance Party is kind of on its own, really, it's not one of the two big blocks of either unionist or nationalist that you get. So you have obviously have the DUP and the UUP as the main kind of unionist parties and then Sinn Féin and the SDLP as the main nationalist parties. So, I mean, Stephen, your election in 2019 was massive. I mean, you got nearly a 36% swing in your favour in December and the Alliance Party in general basically doubled its vote in December Mm -hmm. as well. So what was it in that election, that fight, that you thought, Wow, how how is this how is this going? I know Naomi, you narrowly missed out as well on on going back to Westminster. So what was that like? What was that campaign like? Because Lib Dems have been kind of quite down about what happened in, in twenty nineteen. We got more votes, but we lost Joe and all the rest of it. So what was your campaign like, Stephen? Well, it it wasn't textbook by, by any stretch of the imagination. The the, the the reason for the swing is it's very bizarre because whenever Sylvia Herman was the MP. Sylvia Herman managed to be all things to all people. So she never really took many controversial stands. So people who were, shall we say, fairly hardline unionists felt that she agreed with them. And people who were even moderate nationalists, we don't have too many of those in North Down, but um, um, they also felt that she was sympathetic or was a soft word of unionism that they could vote for. So she managed to get these big majorities for the best part of 15 years. Then along came Brexit. And she had nowhere else to go because Brexit just forced her to take a stand one way or another. So she ended up annoying half her electorate and was, <laughs> was, bat- was battling on for survival. So in all of those elections, while the party did reasonably well in North Down and Assembly and Council level, we were very heavily squeezed in Westminster elections. So sometimes we were, weren't too far off um, losing our deposit. So Sylvia, we... Going into October last year, we were unclear whether Sylvia was going to be standing or not. The party was committed to standing everywhere, but we were probably going to run a fairly low-key campaign in North Down um, and focus our attention elsewhere. And then all of a sudden, Sylvia Herman decided that she wasn't going to stand. So not quite, but not too far off a standing start. We had to um, pull together a campaign, particularly one going into to the winter which wasn't the best for, for, um, for doing too much door-to-door campaigning. But we did what we could in that regard. Um, but the key thing was, was right at the very start, framing the message in very simple terms, and not least around Brexit and progressive values, that this was a choice between myself uh, and the DUP. And we managed to turn it into that two-horse race, virtually from the start. We liked that one. <laughs> Absolutely, knocked out, knocked out everyone, everyone else, and uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even sure we we did a bar chart. Now we did it. We, um, <laughs> we, we, yes, uh, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a disclaimer, no bar charts were involved or got hurt in the process. Um, so we, we just kept banging away at that message, and um, it was it was successful. So we managed to attract people from a, a very broad 
range uh, across the spectrum. Um, now I have a challenge now to keep keeping everyone happy because when you take a, <laughs> I'm not I'm not one who's sit to sit back and basically just sort of um, uh, say nothing on the issues. So uh, it's a, it's a it's a careful. Uh, job to be done and trying trying to navigate all the competing interest groups at the moment mm. yeah but i think as well i mean part of it i mean stephen is obviously you know kind of keeps, tries to be very modest but i mean stephen has said he's been 27 years in politics all of them in north down from councillor to mla you know deputy leader of the party a minister in government and i think people recognize that he was a sensible level-headed person and you know whatever sylvia's politics people respected her as an individual they saw her as somebody who cared about the constituency and was committed to it and i think that that's where stephen really had the advantage because people recognized that he was somebody who could go to westminster and actually would represent them well and they could be proud of what he was doing and i, and I think that matters i think the party also um you know there was huge goodwill in terms of wanting to get into those constituencies where we thought we genuinely did have opportunities um and you know people were willing to come to the, those constituencies and really work hard and so you know it was a stand and start and it was you know a late it was a late campaign start but we were also to some degree lifted and buoyed up because we'd had two very good elections immediately yeah. beforehand which kind of helped sweep through and we had, as a result of that had a massive increase in membership and so i think that all of those things there was a kind of a surge happening and it was enough to kind of lift the party up to the point where people thought you know part of our issue and i think it's part of many kind of smaller party is that it's convincing people that a vote for you particularly in a first past the post isn't a waste so if they see you as a third or fourth runner, they won't bother. They need to think it's you or somebody else before they'll consider you. And I think that that was the key, that suddenly we were framed as a party that could actually contest seats and win them. And I think once you have broken that barrier, we did it in 2010 in East Belfast, we did it in the European elections. I think once you've positioned yourself as a contender, it's much, much easier then to convince people to vote for you. Um, and actually, a lot of our voters would have previously voted for Sylvia on that basis, mm. that they thought she was the best person to stop the DUP getting the seat. So a lot of kind of very dedicated Alliance people would have abandoned us come the election um, because they would have been saying, well, actually, if we vote for you, it might let the DUP through the middle. Um, and there's always that risk, I think, in a, in a first past the post election, mm. because, you know, in other elections there, we've, we've done really well in terms of the assembly and particularly at local council. Um, North Down had a fantastic local council election at the last round. Um, so I think all of those things matter. Um, and it's just, it was, it was good timing in some ways. And actually, I think a short campaign um, everyone was kind of relieved in some ways. It was a short campaign because I think people in Northern Ireland have election fatigue. Um, it, they were just glad that it was done and dusted, but it was a fantastic result. I mean, I've never been happier, um, maybe except when I won myself. <laughs> I, was actually, I think to be fair, I was actually happier for Stephen because um, I knew he would be the one having to get on the plane and go through all that hassle of going back and forward to Westminster. But I was yeah. still really proud that he had won for the party. So it was, but it was you, a good you shouldn't uh, underestimate, though, your result last summer should we because what I, I mean winning a constituency is great and i'm not undervaluing that particularly in the first past the foe system but a liberal voice coming second across the whole province of an area that we think are just extremists on both sides i just was wowed at your result even more than getting what was it 17 uh, or 16 liberal democrat gains how is that liberal candle burning in that province yeah and i mean i think that again speaks to the fact that the party was and is in good spirit um that we were you know willing to take the risk and i mean you know we didn't expect that we would win the seat you know we but we knew that we could in theory we could see the route to win the seat um, we didn't take it for granted, but you know, we, I was willing to put my name forward and take the risk because I felt that it was important that we we delivered a good result. And uh, the key for me was we need to beat our last European result. That, that was the target. Um, and Anna Lowe had polled very well in the previous mm. European elections, and so I was really keen to say, well, you know, a, a win for us is beating that result. 
you know, and that was that was the target. But we could see as we were going out canvassing that there was a mood and you can sense in a constituency when you're out and about that there's some kind of a mood. And I think Brexit had a big role to play because I think the old divisions, unionists, nationalists and all the rest of it, they started to melt away and people's fear was Brexit um, and what that would mean. And so a lot of people who would previously have been Jim Nicholson voters, Ulster unionists, were actually more concerned that the Ulster unionists had no position on Brexit. They couldn't tell what their, where they stood. Um, for us, they saw us as people who had a really strong position when it came to Brexit. We knew what we wanted. We knew what we were out there to do. We even were able to clarify and kind of speak to people about, if you like, the different layers of protection that we were willing to accept and what the compromises might be. Um, so, you know, we wanted Brexit not to happen, but if it was going to happen, these were the conditions that needed to be met. And we were really clear about what our message was. And I think that made a massive difference because I think Brexit is one of those things that comes along maybe once in a generation that really challenges people's kind of old values and um, th their kind of loyalties. And I think it has done in this case, um, particularly those who value the union, but actually valued the European Union as well. Yeah. And I think that many of them are still challenged about that now um, because they see a government that doesn't value that kind of um, European integration, that cooperation and collaboration, that's not only going for a Brexit, but a really hard Brexit and doesn't seem to understand the practical um, and also the political implications of that in Northern Ireland at all and doesn't seem to, to understand the sensitivity of it. And I think that that, for a lot of people, was the message that we were able to give around the fact that we understood the problems. We weren't coming at this from the position maybe of Sinn Féin saying, well, this is an opportunity for us to push for a united Ireland. We certainly weren't coming at it from the DUP's point of view and saying we want a Brexit and it has to be a hard Brexit and, you know, and they were going to push on. So we were coming saying, look, this has major implications for us as a community. And whether you're a unionist or a nationalist, this isn't an orange or green issue. This is about our future and how we're going to be able to do business. And I mean, Stephen's picked up that button in um, Westminster and really run with that in terms of holding the government to account. Um, in terms of how it's been handling Brexit, I've had to deal with it in the executive. And as you know, as Justice Minister, I'm very conscious of the risk that we're still at if we don't get an agreed um, deal, because it leaves us without many of the um, security tools um, and relationships that we need to do cross-border security and justice cooperation. And so there are still major challenges there, and they haven't yet been met by government. Um, and I think that, you know, Stephen, myself and our colleagues, you know, we recognise that this isn't just a, this isn't just about um, people being kind of dreamy eyed about Europe and all the rest of it. This is practical for us. Yeah. We have a, we have a land border. It's difficult to manage. It has been the major contentious issue um, it, on this island in politics, north and south for a hundred years. So there's no kidding ourselves that this was ever going to be easy. And what we don't want to do is introduce other borders, whether those are in the Irish Sea or land borders or whatever. We, we've kind of diminished the importance of borders through cooperation in yeah. the European Union. And that's good for Northern Ireland, where we're able to use that bridge and capital to be able to have good east-west relations, good north-south relations. And instead now we're seeing barriers being thrown up where before there were bridges. We need to work on that and find new ways of continuing those positive relationships in what are non-optimal circumstances, to put it mildly. Well, can perhaps I, we can discuss that. But I point out that the barriers start a mile and a half from where I'm sitting now, where they've had to reorganise the area that deals with the Belfast and the Dublin ferries. Mm -hmm. So yep. there's a, an Irish barrier a mile and a half from where I'm living, but yeah. John. Yeah, and well, my, my best man's, uh, his father runs a haulage company just in the, in the borders, just in, in Northern Ireland. And he is, and his father's terrified of what this might do. And we had an yeah. Irish senator on earlier this week said, the intrinsic links now between the communities on both sides of the board, and, it, and both of which are extremely worried about what Brexit will mean in terms of, destroying those links that have now 
happened because of we've had relative peace for the last two decades and and with from the good friday agreement so i mean stephen from from a westminster point of view i mean the irish senator was pretty brutal about boris johnson saying that northern ireland was a bit of an afterthought in terms mm-hmm. of Brexit. now would you go that far there's a real sense that um in westminster the there's still a lack of understanding of um, Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. And I suppose it's particularly stark amongst the new intake of Conservatives. There's no reference point to what was um, fought for over the past uh, 20 years and all the achievements that have been made, including by people like John Major before them. Um, they all think he's a communist at the moment anyway. So like, <laughs> the, 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 the spectrum has moved so far to the right. Um, Boris Johnson, I mean, first of all, I mean, no one really got Northern Ireland during the Brexit campaign. Theresa May didn't really get it either. There was, a, however, a massive light bulb moment whenever um, she was over, I think it was in February 2019, and Naomi will yeah. remember as well, we, we met her and basically warned her that basically it was either a soft Brexit uh, or she's going to lose, lose the union. And she took that away. Uh, and... Um, probably too late in, in hindsight and really got this not you, you've seen that following through with her interventions over the internal market bill in recent weeks um johnson just plays the whole thing cynically it's all about him that way he's, he's trump he's a narcissist it's all about him he, he bluffed his way through a deal didn't really care what it was as long as he could move on to the next stage didn't really want to understand what was signed up and i suppose now with hindsight we, we look back over the past six months with him denying that there'll ever be any border uh, interfaces down the Irish Sea, saying, oh, don't, don't worry, don't worry. And all of us as rational people were going, well, it's, the agreement says that's going to have to be the, the price you're going to pay for your, for your hard Brexit. So we couldn't get our heads around why he was um, just not grasping that fact. And, and now it's quite clear they were, they were intending just that they didn't mean what they signed up to. And it was all a game, and they were going to try to to, to wriggle out of it. So I think that the the massively over, overplayed their hand. Um, they're twisting the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I mean, this, and this week I, I uh, came quite close. I didn't quite look, but losing my my rag with one of their junior ministers who accused people who were opposing the bill of um, misrepresenting the Good Friday Agreement. We had to remind them that someone was actually helped to negotiate it. So who was he to be making such claims? So um, I think basically they're not grasping. They see Northern Ireland as as part of the UK, but something that they will throw away if they have to. And they see it in very simplistic terms. They don't see Northern Ireland as being a divided society that needs careful management. They don't recognise the role of the Irish government. They don't understand Irish nationalism. N- never mind listen, listen, to, even listen to it. Yeah. Um, so they apply a very narrow path, but it's it's a it's a it's a pathway that's going to lead to destruction. Because first of all, if they don't take into account the complexities of Northern Ireland, they will push more and more people away in terms of support for the union. Um, secondly, um, their Brexit will unravel around them. So if they don't follow through with what they've signed up to, they won't get a trade deal with Europe. They won't get a trade deal with the USA. And the latter point has been a bit of a, bit of a reality check to them. Um, uh, they didn't quite factor that into their game plans. Um, they weren't clever enough. And the UK economy will tank uh, if, there's, if there's a no trade deal um, come, come January. Yeah. So it's a, it's a dead end. It's a head scratching times here. Yeah, I mean, I think the point Stephen makes too about the voices that they listen to, I mean, you know, for the last couple of years during the negotiations, Theresa May was reliant on the DUP. And so they had preferential access. She listened more to them than others. um, And she disregarded other voices that were warning of the dangers of where they were headed. And I remember the meeting that we had with her that morning. Um, I think she was both appalled and shocked at how brutal our exchange with her was. It was it was like at eight o'clock in the morning and I just don't think she was expecting it to be as blunt um, as it was. And then she went out around Northern Ireland and met business people who said it even more bluntly than we had. And I think it was at that point that the penny finally dropped that Brexit actually could unpick the very fabric of the UK. Because 
at the end of the day, the UK is like a family. And it's okay to say, well, the big bit, you know, the, the adult in the room here is England and, and they can do what they want because they're, they're the grown-up. But you've got to keep all of the family happy or it doesn't work anymore. And, you know, treating the rest of us like we're unruly children isn't, a pro isn't the way to handle an issue of this sensitivity. Two parts of the UK wanted to leave. Um, two parts wanted to remain. If you want the UK to stay intact, um, which is what the Conservative and Unionist Party should want to do, you can't ignore the parts that said no to leaving. And you can't ignore the fact that that's divided along nation lines within the UK. It wasn't just that you had half the population took a different view. It was in a very specific um, location. And I think you've got to recognise that. And so, you know, we said to Theresa May, the, the issue here is about what kind of Brexit. If you feel you must deliver a Brexit, um, you know, what kind of Brexit? Why a hard Brexit? Where is the mandate for that when you've got such an, a narrow difference of opinion, um, you know, in terms of percentage? And I don't think that's ever really been answered satisfactorily. I also find it frustrating that Northern Ireland has been used as leverage by the Conservatives, particularly more recently. Um, this idea that, you know, well, you can't do this because you can't have a border in the Irish Sea. You know, at the end of the day, they were the ones who negotiated this deal. They went to the public and said that it was often ready. Um, and the fact that it's a turkey, it's got nothing to do with us. We didn't negotiate it. They did. But they blame everyone else. And, you know, I suppose what I see and what worries me most, there's a complete lack of understanding of what the issues in Northern Ireland are. I find at Westminster there was limited interest in Northern Ireland. Um, you had a few people who maybe served a tour of duty here in the army and had a particular perspective. But beyond that, there was no real understanding and sensitivity to community tensions here. And there's a tendency by the government to treat it like it's a Northern Ireland problem. Actually, this is a UK and Ireland problem. It was fought out in Northern Ireland. But the issues go to the very core of the UK and Ireland. And it's not good enough to simply say that Northern Ireland's problematic. The problems that we have had, the intercommunal tensions that we have had here, are also overlaid with national tensions between those two countries. And working closely with the Irish government was how we unlock the peace process. So the Irish government and the British government working together in lockstep actually allowed us to find space as a community to end the tensions that were being acted out here in very bloody measure um, because we were getting that leadership. When they, when they are at odds, when they ignore each other, when those relationships aren't working, that has direct consequences on how people here interact with each other. And so I don't think there's been a maturity around the responsibility that they have for Northern Ireland. And when you have that responsibility, you cannot be partial. You cannot treat one party like it has, you know, privileged access um, to the prime minister or gets his listening ear when other parts of the community get ignored. I mean, I had a, a bizarre conversation um, with a minister, a very nice minister actually in the government, um, you know, who this week was talking to me and said, well, there's always, of course, the defence that we're only doing in Northern Ireland to, to people what, um, you know, we're doing in the rest of the UK and you can use that argument. And I said, that argument doesn't stand with Irish Republicans. They don't recognise the validity of the UK government's involvement in Ireland at all. So saying you're being treated like other UK citizens, first of all, denies that they're Irish citizens. And secondly, completely ignores the fact that these people don't recognise the legitimacy of the state. Now, that's a challenge that I don't think the British government actually understand, but that we have to deal with every single day and I'm acutely aware of it in my role in terms of justice um, and the challenges that it brings but I think that there's a lack of sensitivity and an unwillingness to listen to those of us who have lived this um, you know and I get a little bit frustrated when I hear you know civil servants with the best will in the world in England who will say you know we've dedicated six months of our lives to trying to get this right and I'm looking at them going this is my lived experience for the entire 48 years of my life. Um, and I have more vested in this than anybody because 
we're still here living this. So, you know, it's all well and good that it's a project for some people, but for us, it's, it's our lived experience, it's our neighbours, it's our neighbourhoods, it's our family and friends. And it really matters that people understand the complexities of it um, and listen to all sides of the argument and give equal weight to what people are saying. Because I think the danger is that you get a very, a very kind of um, single identity view of Northern Ireland um, and a lack of sensitivity. And I think it's much worse, I have to be honest, I think it's much worse under this government, but it was tracking in that direction really from David Cameron's time. Um, but he was much less likely to, he wasn't reliant on the DUP, so he wasn't tied in the same way. It really deteriorated during that period when Theresa May needed the DUP, um, and it has unbalanced the discussion here. As we look forward, though, the fact is that whatever deal, no deal, bad deal is, we are about to leave. And I wonder if we could just close on, on a more positive note, because I know we're, we're, we are running out of time. And it seems to me that there are two things that we could be looking at as political parties. Firstly, you mentioned the UK family, but as we've talked about, we're also in the Liberal family. And we were privileged to have the Taoiseach of Ireland from Fianna Fáil, a fellow member of Aldi, address our party conference earlier this week. Um, we could perhaps do things as liberal parties together, recognising the proximity of Liverpool, Belfast and Dublin and recreate some of the mechanisms which fortunately fell away through the Good Friday Agreement. So there's a liberal way to do it. And then perhaps there's another geographical way to do it, because I'm aware of the ferries that go to and from Northern Ireland and Liverpool, and but the Republic for that matter. Liverpool as a city region is roughly the size of population, perhaps a bit slightly better GDP than Northern Ireland, 1.7 million people. What could we do together, mm. Northern Ireland and our city region? And I was talking to a member of the Manx government, the Isle of Man government, a couple of weeks ago, and they'd be quite interested in this. If we're going out to sell the world, uh, sell ourselves to the world, could the Liverpool city region and Northern Ireland do that together? So just some thoughts yeah. about positive things we can do to try and ameliorate the terrible problems we've got. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we have the, we've had this conversation as a party as well, because, I mean, obviously the assembly being restored was critical because it allowed the North-South institutions to be back up and running again. And at a very practical level, they're important, but they also create space for us as politicians to engage with our counterparts um, in the Republic on a formal basis, but also around the fringes of that informally and allow us to kind of work together on issues around, uh, around these issues. Those kind of conversations, I think we also need to, to have re-injected uh, some energy to them through things like um, the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference. Because I think again, you know, the government maybe doesn't place a huge amount of um, value on those, but I think that those conversations that would have been happening in places like Europe and so on will no longer be happening between heads of government and so on in, in as regular a way. And so it's important that if we're going to lose the kind of the, the different um, vehicles that we had for discourse and dialogue, we need to then replace them with something else because I'm very clear that the future for us um, in Northern Ireland, the future for these islands, is about being integrated into the wider European project. It is about cooperation and collaboration with our nearest neighbours. And I think that regardless of whether we're doing that inside the EU or from outside the EU, we still have to do it. We just have to be more creative about it. I mean, we were chatting before um, about the, 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 the city of uh, the cities of the Isles sort of thing. And the idea that, you know, there's an opportunity for us to build on things like, for example, our shared maritime heritage, um, the fact that we are port cities, um, the fact that we have this kind of long history um, as cities were essentially, we had a lot of migration um, from Ireland to Liverpool and the surrounding areas and, and all of that. So I think that there are opportunities for us to build those relationships. And I always think that it is good for us um, in Northern Ireland to be reaching out and building those relationships with our near neighbours so that we have a better understanding um, of each other and that we have better lines of cooperation. I think Europe is a massive loss um, in terms of the liberal side of things because 
actually, this parliament is one where liberal values were, were hugely influential. And I saw that even in the eight short months that I was there. We, we suddenly saw um, ALD having real power in, in the parliament. But we also saw the attacks on that, those liberal values from Fidesz and others. Um, and just being able to stand up against that, to challenge against it, um, and try to develop kind of more liberal strategies across Europe. Because, you know, Northern Ireland has its problems, but there are other faltering democracies across Europe that will need mm. our support. And I, for one, want to be part of a country um, and part of a movement that cares about those things, that doesn't see what happens in Hungary or Poland as somebody else's problem, but actually sees ourselves as, see ourselves as part of the solution in those situations to speak up for people. I mean, Stephen talked about speaking up for people maybe who couldn't speak up for themselves, trying to be a voice of challenge. I, I think that, that liberalism still has that role to play. And being outside the European Union won't stop me standing up for my colleagues, as I did this week, um, in terms of, you know, the calls to remove the, the Liberal Vice President from the Parliament because she had spoken out against Hungary and, and the current regime there. I think she's absolutely justified in calling into question the level of democracy there. And I, for one, will continue to support her inside the European Union or outside. So I think it's about trying to create as many vehicles as possible to have those conversations and links to maintain them. Small things, I'm still... Um, part of the Renew Europe um, WhatsApp group for all the women in the Renew <laughs> Europe party. Some of it is about wishing each other happy birthdays and celebrating our successes. And some of it is hard politics. So when, for example, the UK government was announcing the internal markets bill, I was able to go straight to some fairly senior French politicians who are very close to Emmanuel Macron and talk to, the, talk to them about our concerns and about the challenges of all of that. And that networking is absolutely crucial. We're just going to have to work so much harder um, to be able to continue with it. And I think probably final word to you, Stephen, about, you know, I do realise we are right on the edge of our time mm -hmm. and you guys have got to go. But firstly, just thank you both for being on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're at, a, we're at a crucial point in the Union, for Northern Ireland, everything. So... <laughs> What what what's next for you, really? As we come up to the the a, a no deal in all likelihood, how do you deal with that in Westminster? What's next for you? Well, I suppose I mean just to build on Naomi's point. I mean, we have we do have to recognise that we are in a very fluid situation in these islands, um, and again, I mean this is an opportunity um, for for liberalism. Obviously, they're, they're very polarised and very mutually exclusive um, aspirations as to what that should be. Um, that's not the way we have we have acted in the past. So th there may well be some scope for a bit of creativity that we need to to apply ourselves to as well. The other thing, just in closing, the stress is that um, it's not particularly, particularly direct at Northern Ireland, but there is an ongoing challenge for liberalism now in this era of populist politics as to how we uh, we uh, reframe the, the message, um, how you um, be a liberal in the in the world of combating COVID. Um, how does liberalism um, translate itself into the climate change battle uh, and the, the various choices and challenges that have to be made in that regard? So there are, there are deep issues now that we're well into the 21st century that we're, we are going to have to wrestle with in terms of our, 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 as to how we apply our eternal values to the situation that we find ourselves in. But obviously for us in, in, in Northern Ireland, but the UK and Ireland as, as a whole, there are some big discussions that are going to have to be taking place over the coming decade. That we have to be proactive and, and constructive in. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think Stephen just, I think that's absolutely right. What I would say is, I think the liberal values are still as relevant as ever and more important perhaps than they've ever been, particularly at this time. But we need to learn from the communication methods of some of the more populist elements in politics. They're very good at slogans and phrases and condensing their message into something easily understood. Sometimes our messages are nuanced and complex and confusing. And I think as liberals, we need to learn to communicate with a, with a population that now does it more in slogans and rhetoric than, and is more used to kind of short sound bites than kind of long thought pieces. And we're going to have to adapt our communication skills, I think, just to fit a new era. But I'm positive about it because I think we have a lot of substance to say 
And that to me is what matters. It's the content. We just need to get the presentation right. And that's what we're continuing to work on. And as I say, Stephen had some snappy slogans when he was in North Down running for election and that helped too. <laughs> so I think if we, if, we, if we can get that right, we can get the communications right, um, I, I think that there's a, a really positive future um, for liberalism because I think that is the new divide between those who are just populist and base in their motives and those who are actually want freedoms and, uh, uh, and democracy um, and human rights protected. And I, I know which side of the fence I'm on, but we just need to get out there and sell it to people as an alternative. Uh, and, and short statements are always very difficult for scousers <laughs> and the Irish. Now. Absolutely. We must <laughs> practice these skills, as you rightly say. But as, <laughs> as the Alliance Party website says, better is possible, but it's not inevitable. And so, and that's why that's why you guys are in there. And if anyone here listening, viewing this podcast, wants to know more, please go to the Alliance Party website. It's allianceparty.org. There you can join, you can volunteer, you can donate, and and keep up with all the latest news of what's going on. I, I was going to say, Naomi uh, and Stephen, that has been absolutely fantastic to have you on. I I, I really appreciate it. And, and you know, going forward, would love to have you back on because, like you said, it is incredibly fluid at the moment. We have. You know, a week is a long time in politics, so let's see what happens in the next couple of months before Brexit <laughs> arrives. But, um, but it's just absolutely fabulous to have you on. So thank you so much. I would like to thank all our listeners for, for tuning into this podcast, for downloading it, and staying in touch with the Lib Dem podcast. We have loads of episodes coming up, so do follow us at, at Lib Dem Pod. Uh, and thank you very much for watching, and we'll have another episode very soon. <laughs>